Transmitter device activating. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 Podcast, your weekly explanation of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters through the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. We return this week to the pages of The Flash. We haven't been there for a little while. It's probably not that long as the crow flies, but it's certainly been a number of episodes since we last hung out with Barry, if you pardon the expression. Mm -hmm. So, this week we are doing the lead story from issue 227, which was published on the 26th of February, 1974. And Peter's going to tell you about the fantastic cover. It's a great cover. It's one of these crying flash covers. So it is. Yeah, a lot of that at this time. It's a little different from the usual, though, because it's not a full-length figure of the Flash standing going. That's true. Or, like, on a park bench, yeah. you know, or something like that. It's fine. It's very, very, very dramatic. We've got the usual Flash logo at the top. We've got the line of DC superstars in the top left corner. And the only 20 cents logo. Solo starring in this issue, Green Lantern. He's the backup strip. Yes. Because this is the period where he doesn't have his own title. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I can. I'm, I'm imagining it right now. It's crazy. Green Lantern relegated to a backup strip. But yes, the main image in the cover is this distraught, crying, sweaty, yes. wet-faced Flash. Ugh. Big, wide blue eyes staring in horror at a book that he has open. The back cover of the book has a lovely heroic hands on hips, legs apart pose of the Flash. Copying the pose right now for the benefit of our YouTube viewers. Mm. But the title of the book is in the front cover and it's in big yellow letters and it says, Flash, this is your death. Gosh. And poor Barry is saying, it isn't possible. I can't die this way. And in the bottom, there's a scroll caption with one of those wonderful Carmine-esque pointy fingers. And it says... Reader, can you face the terrible secret of this book? Gosh. My goodness. It's a beast, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Nick Cardi, almost at his best. It's almost as though there's a light shining out of the book, the way that Barry's sort of lit up, and he's almost like he's, you know, it looks like he's front lit and there's shadows and stuff behind him. Very, very effective. It's like the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. Do you know what? I've only seen Pulp Fiction once. Ah. Uh -huh. And it was at a midnight showing in summer of 1995. Okay. And I don't remember. <laughs> You can take my word for it. It's fine. <laughs> cool, I shall. I'm, I'm not doubting you in the slightest. No, I remember it's one of those films that impressed me so much that I decided that I would never watch it again because I did not want to diminish or lessen the experience that I oh, just really? had. Yeah. Gosh, Wilkers. Me and my friend Stephen Ottaway went to a midnight show and at this point we're both still living in Paisley so we had to get the midnight mm. bus back. Well, not the midnight bus, an overnight through the night bus which went... Went to Paisley via Barhead. Gasp. And then I had to be back in to work for all winners trading cards through the back of Forbidden Planet Buchanan Street, Glasgow at 10 o'clock on the Sunday morning. <laughs> so there. Join us next week for more of David's cinematic history. Yes. Listeners, <laughs> we're recording this the day after I bumped into Patrick Wilson in Chinatown in London. Fantastic. Didn't get a picture. He was in a hurry. But there you go. Right. The Flash 227. Lots of acting in this one, listeners. Apologies to anyone who's offended by the accents. We open... An image, it's almost like a page in a scrapbook. You see a couple of photographs, it looks like photographs, that have been mounted and fixed into position. The Flash logo at the top leads us to a caption which reads, Depicted below are sections of a pair of pages from a scrapbook. A souvenir album being kept of the long-running battle between The Flash and his arch-enemy, Captain Boomerang. The first image that's mounted on this page Shows the flash tied to a giant boomerang that's being launched into the sky by Captain Boomerang. If, I think we've had him on the podcast before, haven't we? Oh, yes. Remember the Captain Boomerang with uh, the trickster and Gorilla Grodd was manipulating them faster than the speed of life? Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. The contentious one. The one you didn't want to do. <laughs> yes, this, this is a bit contentious as well, listeners. And as Captain Boomerang fires the flash tied to his boomerang into the air off his catapult, Captain Boomerang is saying, Away you go, Flash, on a doom trip into outer space. And the next image, it looks like Barry just sort of stood on another giant boomerang that's flying through the air. <laughs> and Captain Boomerang is holding another smaller boomerang and flying along beside him, saying, There goes Flash, heading into an endless orbit around the Earth. He'll never bother me again. And then another caption reads, While we are unable to show you the final page of this album, we have been given permission to reproduce the book's grim title. Flash, Flash this, this is, is your, your death. death. Gosh, and another caption box tells us that this story has been brought to us by Carrie Bates, Art Irv Novik and Frank McLaughlin, editing Julie Schwartz. Fantastic. We turn to the top of page two, 
And the first panel, interestingly, the, the first top left-hand corner of the panel has another little triangular cardboard mount as if we're reading from the scrapbook. And a caption says, It all started last Tuesday when a top security paddy wagon arrived at Central City Police Headquarters. Yes, a green police van, two cops opening the back door, another officer, armed officer, covering them, who says, OK, boys, open the doors and let him out. Slow and easy. And the caption for panel two reads, A prisoner was being confined for a few hours. Yes, see the prisoner. Thin-looking fellow, wearing a... Looks like he's wearing a straight jacket, actually. Mm -hmm. Long, thin face, receding auburn hair, all curling backwards. As he's being led forward, he says, Blimey, I was enjoying the ride to the new state pen. Why this stopover? And the armed policeman says, An anonymous call came in, Digger. Said there was a bomb hidden on the patrol wagon. There's a lot of captioning throughout this story, listeners. I'm not going to announce them all. Peter's just going to do them. So caption for panel three reads, They called him by his nickname, Digger. But cops and robbers alike knew him far better in costume as the notorious criminal Captain Boomerang. See Captain Boomerang being led towards an open gate, no other word for it, and as he's being led, he's being watched by a balding middle-aged desk sergeant. And, gosh, look at the length of Barry's hair. What happened to the crew cut? <laughs> and Barry Allen in a sort of smart, is that a green suit jacket or a green overall type jacket, coat type effort? Barry Allen, a.k.a. The Flash, is also watching. And as Digger is being led along, the armed cop is saying, We're locking you in a cell here for safekeeping while we search the wagon. Digger replies, Good. I hope you get blown up instead of me. And panel four is being placed in his cell. He says to the cop, Hey, how about taking off this bloody strike jacket while I'm locked up here? Yes, it's okay. After all, you are behind bars. But then another voice says, Hold it, guard. And we see that their momentum has been arrested by Barry Allen, who says in the next panel, You must be new here, or you'd know you can never take chances with a criminal as dangerous as Boomerang. The jacket stays on. Cop looks surprised. Obviously, he's you know maybe feeling a little bit chastened by what Barry's just said. But Captain Boomerang, look at that spectacular receding hairline. Good grief. Captain Boomerang says, Oh, thanks a heap, creep. And Barry gets a nice close-up to round out page two, which actually also has, I now realise, looking at the whole page, every corner of every exterior panel, as it were, has these little photo album mounts. So that's quite pretty. Watch out and see if any of them make it onto the socials. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this close-up of Barry rounding out page two is captioned. Diggers soon found out this meddlesome bloke was Barry Allen, a police scientist on duty at the time. He took a long, hard look at Allen to make sure he'd remember the face of the man he owed one to. Gosh, we arrive at the top of page three. The usual gawkers were herded out of range while the bomb threat was checked out. But one man in the crowd was not worried in the least bit, since he was the anonymous caller who tipped the police. Yeah, in the first panel we see the crowd being managed and a couple of officers examining the police van. And the fellow who made the call, well, he's got a certain similarity to Captain Boomerang. Riotous receding auburn hair, but his is going a bit grey around the temples. He's wearing a purple suit. A bootlace tie, if that means anything to the young people. Mm -hmm. He has glasses on, he's a bag over his shoulder, and he stands amongst the, the concerned-looking crowd thinking, Ha! Hey, even if those bobbies check out every nut and bolt in that wagon, they'll find no bomb. The call was a hoax, engineered to get Digger off the street and into police headquarters. Now, the rest is up to him. And we cut back to Captain Boomerang in his cell in a caption reading, And Captain Boomerang was up to something, that's for sure. His arms were restrained, but no one could put shackles on his wily brain. And Captain Boomerang has an odd expression on his face here. He looks almost pleased with himself. Maybe it's just the way it's been printed. And he's thinking, I have to hand it to myself for planning ahead for tough times like this. Last year I went around to every jail within a hundred miles of Central City, secretly planning special getaway boomerangs. As each getaway rang was tossed into a cell and dropped out of sight, where it would remain undetected till an emergency arose. And we see over a sequence of three panels at the bottom of page three, indeed Captain Boomerang hurling some boomerangs into cells. They're sort of bright pink, I would say, and we see them fading out mm -hmm. as they are placed. Very interesting. A flashback, etc. We return to Boomerang in his cell at the top of page four as he continues to think. And me, in a straight jacket on my way to the choky shore ranks in the emergency department. A getaway boomerang's around here somewhere. Concentration will bring it out into the open. Within a minute, Digger's concentrated brain waves materialise the unique weapon. Yes, we see the pink L shape start to appear as the boomerang takes form. 
And in panel three, it lifts up in there and, oh, well, very interesting. Digger helps us out by thinking, each getaway boomerang is armed with an assortment of escape tools. In my present condition, the knife blade is my best bet. And sure enough, almost like a Swiss army knife, we see a, it looks like a nail file actually, sliding out of one end of the boomerang. Swiss army boomerangs, listeners. Mm -hmm. They supported menswear probably, didn't they? (laughs) The caption for panel four of page four. Guided solely by telepathy, the razor-sharp blade began to cut away. Must be extra careful, thinks Digger. An idle thought in the wrong direction, and I'll end up a bloody mess. Yes, we can see the blade starting to work on his straitjacket, and panel five is triumphant. He stands up, throws off the straitjacket, dropping it on the floor, thinking, Ah, free as a bird. Now to fly away from here. But first, of course, I must be suitably dressed. And then we see him grasping the getaway boomerang, and this is genius. <laughs> when did we last see anything as fun or as amusing or as, what's the word, ingenious mm-hmm. from a comic book bad guy? He activates another switch on his boomerang, and a familiar uniform appears in midair. As Digger thinks, nothing like a compressed costume that expands in contact with the air. <laughs> Bet I'm the first costume freak that ever came up with that gimmick. Yes, listeners, that's a loaded statement. We know what he's saying there. Yes. We continue in the third page following. Oh, there's a nice 100-page advert with that issue of the JLA that was the first 100 page that you ever got. And the caption for the top of page five reads, What a picture that must have been. A thin laser beam flashing from the tip of the boomerang. These boomerangs are phenomenal. Why is he doing anything else? These boomerangs have just got everything you could ever need, ever. Yep. We see him using the <laughs> boomerang, firing you know, this laser beam, and it's melting the bars of his cell so he can get away. Panel 5 are back with the policeman and the desk sergeant as they watch the boomerang fly through the air in front of them. The cop says, Hey, Sarge, what's that boomerang flying into the room, leaving a thick trail of smoke? The desk sergeant stands up, says, Blast! It can only mean (coughs) that boomerang (coughs) is (coughs) setting up a smoke screen for escape. And sure enough, a large, thick cloud of purpley grey smoke coming out of the boomerang fills up the room, causing a Perfect distraction for Captain Boomerang to rush past the two policemen. In the confusion, Digger retrieved his weapon, but on his way out, he couldn't resist tossing it to settle a score. Yes, in this panel we see him grabbing the boomerang and hurling it towards a certain police scientist who's carrying a, a tray full of test tubes and jars and stuff. And as he hurls the boomerang at Barry, Captain Boomerang says, From me to you, Barry Allen, for rubbing me the wrong way. And I have to say, before I go any further, that's two consecutive pages with the names of Beatles <laughs> songs. We had From Me to You there, and previously we had Free mm. as a Bird, which obviously wasn't released until 1995. But you catch my drift. Caption for the next panel reads, As usual, the boomerang struck its target, but with unexpected results. Yes, there's a nice little pink flash as the boomerang hits where Barry was, and a giant sound effect as he disappears. Boomerang looks astonished and says, Huh? That bloke popped out of sight! And catches the boomerang. And I mean that for our YouTube viewers in the final panel of page five, thinking, Either my boomerang pulled a fast one on me, or Alan did. Now, what do we think was most likely, listeners? As we arrive at the top of page six, a caption reads, One puzzle led to another, for when Digger stepped outside police headquarters. Yes, we see Captain Boomerang looking resplendent in his gear, clutching the, the getaway rang in his hand, and a familiar red blur accelerating towards him. Boomerang says, The, the Flash? Where the damn under did he come from? In a flash, the Scarlet Speedster went into his act. Yes, the Flash is still accelerating towards Boomerang, twirling his left hand, creating a vortex, which has the desired effect as Boomerang cries, Oh! Really backward from his cursed air gusts! Yes, indeed, we see him falling backwards, still keeping hold of his boomerang, though. Caption for panel three! At hurricane speed, he kept poor Digger flailing ahead of him till they were outside the city. This is a great panel. This could almost be Carmine. I love it. Flash running along, twirling his left hand, creating a vortex, which is creating a little cloud, which is driving Captain Boomerang along in front of him. As he's floating along, poor Boomerang's thinking, Flash thinks he's got me, but I'm not quite as helpless as I look. And the next panel has one of those caption boxes that we love, which has a little carmine hand pointing a finger down at the action as the caption reads, That was no idle brag. Since our last skirmish, Digger had developed a technique for contorting his body in a highly precise fashion, so that he literally became a human boomerang. Yes, we can see that the captain is bending himself forward at the waist, so he's almost forming a right angle. And in the next panel, he starts to, well, very interestingly, the flash helps us out. When he thinks, Good grief! His body suddenly became aerodynamic. 
using the force of my speed to send him catapulting far ahead of me. Yes, because Captain Boomerang has taken a sort of angled right angle shape, he is twisting and turning and almost boomeranging away from the Flash, the caption of the final panel of page six. And since the basic principle of the boomerang makes it return from where it came... Flash thinks in the final panel... M- my own trick! Boomeranging back at me! Yes, because suddenly Digger is hurtling towards the Flash, and in the first panel of page seven he collides with him, knocking him flying. Now this is great, it gets all very fourth wall here, listeners. This first panel of page seven has the little picture mounts around it and it's clear that this page that we're looking at now the camera sort of pulls back and we can see a hand holding the corner of a book and it's clear that the story's being narrated as a voice says flesh was cut off guard and knocked unconscious isn't that the way it happened son and the camera pulls back to see captain boomerang standing in front of the older gentleman with the purple suit and the bootlace tie that we saw in the crowd earlier boomerang says exactly pop those instamatic color photos you took along with your colorful narration Made for a beautiful account of my latest battle with the Flash. And we see Captain Boomerang's dad sitting on a big rock, closing the book that he's holding, and we see on the cover that it reads, Flash, this is your death. And as he's doing a listen, settling himself, he replies, Glad to hear that, Digger. And there's an amazing bit of captioning next, when we see a hand kind of going, Wait, hold up. And all this captioning for this next panel's worth reads. Wait a minute. Is that what you readers are shouting out there? Well... As you should have guessed by now, you've been reading pages out of a scrapbook, kept by a man named Ozzy Green, a two-shilling crook from Australia who happens to be the father of Captain Boomerang. In the next panel, Captain Boomerang steps towards his dad, saying, And thanks again, Pop, for pulling off that bomb scare that got me behind bars. I couldn't have busted out without your help. My pleasure, son, says Boomerang's dad, still holding the book. And then the caption for the next panel, which is another little pointing carmine hand, reads... Wait a sec, you cry this time. Yes, we know, there's something else to be cleared up. Police scientist Barry Allen's sudden disappearance. Final panel of page 7 is a little flashback to the and disappearance and tray dropping, vanishing act of the flash when Digger was escaping from prison. And as we arrive at the top of page 8, a caption reads, What the scrapbook didn't show, because Ozzy Green couldn't possibly have known, was that the police scientist vibrated his atoms at invisible super speed and pressed a ring that released a compressed scarlet uniform which he donned at invisible super speed to become his alter ego, the fastest man alive. And all of that unnecessary caption, come on Carrie Bates, Peter's not been well. (laughs) What are you trying to do? Because we see two panels of the Flash activating his costume compressor ring, his costume flying out, and Barry putting his uniform on as he thinks... Now the captain will think his boomerang suddenly made Barry Allen disappear, giving me a chance to intercept him outside as The Flash. And we return to the present, as it were, and the caption of the next panel reads, And if you're wondering what has since happened to the fallen Flash, see for yourself. We're still out in the pleasant forest park surroundings of Central City. Ozzy Green is standing, still with a book in his hand. Captain Boomerang is standing, but The Flash, he's been restrained on a chair which appears to be some kind of launching mechanism we can see what looks like hydraulics and a couple of big levers that are obviously going to try and position it or send him flying when he's not looking and the flash is starting to come to his senses as he says hey what happened ozzy green says he's waking up son you sure he won't be vibrating himself loose to which boomerang says not a chance pop i sprayed him with my special paralyzing formula He's frozen stiff. We see that Boomerang is holding an aerosol in his hand. The Flash replies to this. Uh, uh, It's true. Except for my head, I can't budge a single molecule. Don't worry, Flash, says Boomerang. The effects will soon wear off. What's your diabolical scheme this time, Captain? Why am I trussed up like a human boomerang? Because you're going on a one-way trip, my flashy foe, into a nightmarish world where every split second you survive will only serve to prolong your death agony. And with that, Boomerang activates one of the levers, and he says, Blast off! And this sends the Flash, hurtling out of the chair, looping around up into the sky. Gosh! Ozzy Green says to this, We are sure, me lad, is Flash really on his way out? Not like the other times you said him boomeranging to his doom? A thousand percent sure. I launched him into another dimension I discovered during a recent experiment. It's swarming with monstrous menaces that will panic him to death. And at that, we see the Flash hurtling up into the air, and it almost looks as though his legs are fading out, as presumably he's passing into this other dimension. Mm -hmm. We'll probably stick that panel on the socials, I think. Oh, yes. 
The next panel we're back with Ozzy and Digger. Ozzy holding up the book as if he's about to make another edition or something and he's saying to Boomerang, Bully, it makes the perfect ending for my scrapbook. A slow dissolve. Meantime, the Scarlet Speedster is boomeranging through a realm more terrifying than even his wildest nightmares. Yes, we have to try and get this panel on the, the socials as well. And how interesting that the Flash has been hurtled into a weird, dare we say it, dream dimension populated by scary looking, weird, demonic, goblin like creatures. Hmm. That almost look, and some, some of them look like disembodied heads or like that one at the bottom right, the yellow one looks like a giant, scary bird. It does. Is this an unintentional crossover with the Sandman? Who knows? But this time it's a crossover with the Kirby Sandman instead of Flash 176, which was another cross. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> All these weird, demonic, scary shapes are glaring at the Flash as he goes head over heels through this weird dimension, thinking... About to be attacked on all sides. That paralysing formula seems to be wearing off, giving me a chance to defend myself. First panel of page 10. Barry's still hurtling through. The monsters are still surrounding him as he thinks... Wait! Now that I can move again, I won't. The only way to save myself is to remain absolutely rigid, not vibrate a molecule. Gosh. The next panel we cut back to Digger and Ozzy. Digger's holding the book and we see that a photograph has now been put in place showing the Flash attached to that weird launching apparatus. Boomer is thinking, what a beautiful shot of my greatest triumph, the Flash Boomerang. It was my proudest moment and my arch foe's most humiliating defeat. Please, Pop, let me do the blurb that goes with this page. But Ozzy Green is distracted. He's looking up and he <gasps> gasps. Boomerang says, what is it, Pop? You look like you've just seen a Ghost, says Ozzy. Yeah, yeah, well, look. Boomerang looks up and it's his turn to look astonished and dismayed as he says, Oh no, backfiring on me. And in the first panel of page 11, we see looping and turning and twirling as he falls back down towards them. It's the Flash in the second panel of page 11. He collides with Boomerang, who cries, Oof! <laughs> and falls on his backside in the capture for panel three reads, And when the stunned rogue regains his senses... Yes, Boomerang... His hair still immaculate says, How did you ever find your way back? I made sure there was no way you could move out of that dimension. Oh, but there was one way, Digger. So simple it never occurred to you. I merely observed the principle of the boomerang. It always returns to its sender. So even though I was free to move again, I kept my body in boomerang form. As soon as I realised those fearsome monsters were mere mirages that couldn't harm me or scare me to death. Yep, and we see Flash with the scary monsters behind him now as he's facing away from them and he's thinking... As I figured, my natural trajectory is taking me out of that nightmarish dimension. In moments, I'll be boomeranging into the captain. Fantastic, and we're back in the real world for the final panel of page 11 as Boomerang grabs a hold of his dad, saying... Nice stunt, Flash, but I'm not sticking around to pay for my mistake. Come on, Pop! There's room for two. And using his getaway boomerang, he launches them both into the air. Flash reaches to try and catch him, thinking... He had a trick boomerang up his sleeve, making one of his specialised getaways. One of his specialised getaways is the name of a song somewhere, isn't it, listeners? Let's be <laughs> honest. Maybe I'll go and write it. And the first part of page 12, we see Ozzy and Boomer flying through the air with a Flash in pursuit. The Flash notices where they're going and thinks... His flight path is taking him over a lake. And that's another mistake he's made. And indeed, the caption for panel two reads, Over the water circles the super speedster. So fast, his feet just skim over the surface. This is great. And in panel two, it's some classic Flash action listeners as we see the Flash running in a circle very quickly on the surface of the lake, thinking, Whipping up a water spout. Higher, higher, right on target. He thinks in panel three as the water spout collides with the two flying Australians. In panel four, they both plummet. Into the lake, as the Flash thinks. That splashdown marks another boomerang bust. And a caption for panel five reads. And as Flash carries his captives to Central City Police Headquarters. Yes, speeding through the gorgeous panoramic scenery outside Central City, with Boomer under one arm and Aussie Green under the other, the Flash is thinking. I wonder how the older guy, the one named Pop, fits into this caper. And we close, because yes, listeners, we're at the end already. We see Flash, this is your death, floating. In the lake, and a caption reads, Pop leaves behind a scrapbook that didn't live up to its grim title. Yes. I wonder if anyone will find the book. Will it come back, listeners? It's interesting. We'll probably never know. Yes, the book starts to sink into the, the lake, and a caption reads, End. Well, listeners, 
That was a bit tenuous <laughs> for a couple of panels of the Flash being thrown into another dimension. But as Peter is going to tell us, it's not the first time that the Flash and Captain Boomerang have been involved in a little sideways thingy to another dimension. Is it, Peter? This is true. In fact, uh, giant space boomerangs is kind of a, a motif for Captain Boomerang, even though it, it was turning the Flash into a giant space boomerang in this story. Yet in issue 124, the issue after Flash of Two Worlds, Captain Boomerang appeared and encountered both the Flash and Elongated Man mm. in a story called The Space Boomerang Trap, in which Barry was attached to a giant boomerang and fired off into space. And every single time this happens, Barry always does exactly the same thing and just stays perfectly still because boomerangs always come back. In that story, Captain Boomerang actually teamed up with the Elongated Man and the Flash because there was an invasion by aliens from another dimension. Gosh, perhaps that's uh, how Captain Boomerang discovered this strange dream dimension. Yeah. From this experience. The aliens, they're kind of weird listeners, they're kind of orange looking with long hair, they're almost like skullets. We we talked vaguely about doing a flashback, but I just thought, you know, they could have been aliens from another world, really, for all the yeah, huh? for all that sort of gets said. So we just thought, given that we were already doing this tenuous <laughs> short story with a visit to another, another dimension to save on the editing time, that we could just mention this other tenuous one. Yes. So that, you know, any completists out there that might be worrying about Captain Boomerang and other dimensions, that mm. their, their mm -hmm. worries are going to be put to rest. That was quite an interestingly formatted story that we've just done there. I was very, yeah. very impressed by it. I liked, took me a while to spot it was happening, but I liked how each of the, the initial pages had those little cover, I'm miming for the benefit of YouTube, yes. had those little mounts at the corner. Mm -hmm. That's obviously quite a nice considered sort of thing that someone obviously had the idea of doing before they even started. I really like that. It certainly is, yes. And of course, the narration should have been by uh, Digger's dad for that, but that was totally giving the game away, so we just did our standard narration for that part of the story. <laughs> yes, honest listeners, we knew exactly what we were doing. Of course we did. If I'd been doing Ozzy's voice for all that, it would have really given, as you say, given the game away. It wouldn't have been any fun at all. Yeah. Is this the only time that Captain Boomerang's dad turns up? Yeah, it's the only time I'm aware of him, huh? Interesting. I wonder if he died in prison. That's a bit dark, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Anyway. <laughs> maybe he found one of uh, his son's getaway boomerangs, which is in every single cell in Central City. What madness is that? Yes, that's fantastic. It's, I it's love it. Bronze Age bizarreness, Carrie Bates. Yeah. I love you. It's great. <laughs> I, no, I love that. It was the fact that Boomerang had gone to all this preparation mm -hmm. sort of trouble. Yes. And he'd made so, made so many of these laser beam smoke emitting yep. Swiss Army blade type things and placed one in every single cell. Yes. Did he get Paul Gamby to help mass produce <laughs> them using a, a sweatshop in a, an eastern country or something? I have no idea. It's wonderful. And of course, right, let's, let's have a look at these boomerangs. They can yes. vibrate into invisibility. They're telepathically controlled. Yeah. They have a switchblade in them. They can generate a mm. smoke screen. Yeah. And, of course, they have a compressed Captain Boomerang costume inside them. Every single one. So Paul Gamby <laughs> must have been involved. <laughs> he would have loved it when that order came in. Yeah, maybe the uniform that um, Boomerang's wearing in this one is a bit of a Primark style, not quite, you know, <laughs> not quite the usual high quality type yes. of, of uniform. I'm amazed, given that he's created these boomerangs, that Captain Boomerang was ever defeated by the Flash. Yeah, I've got a whole theory on the Flash rogues, which is uh, why they are the way they are. Right, go on. It's a very early Flash story. Uh, I think it's actually from Flash 105, in which Flash encounters this alien who has a gun uh, that basically makes people super intelligent. Right. And I have a feeling that this gun was maybe used by someone else or by the alien on some random people and basically made... The rogues, still true to their own kind of personalities, and it made them super geniuses, but didn't give them any loftier goals in life, any altruism, anything, you know, Interesting. that would actually benefit sure. themselves or mankind and basically has their petty crime goals. I kind of think that happened because I think I'm pretty sure it was in Flash 105. Right. And of course, that's the first Mirror Master story as well. Unfortunately, it doesn't hold out for all the rogues because that happened after sure. the debuts of both Captain Cold and uh, Mr. Element. Yeah. Because they appeared in Showcase. Uh -huh. But if you fudge the timeline, I, I'll be honest, in, in the 90s, I had a, a whole, um, <laughs> I had a whole story sketched out as to all this and how it all worked and why the rogues were then reformed and uh, Abracadabra was involved, Grodd was involved, etc, etc. Uh, and I had right. this whole plot worked out. Never did anything with it, but it tied up continuity wonderfully and was I, th I felt it was quite entertaining. One day, one day, you never know. Interesting. 
but then I suppose what did they publish something that, that contradicted your your theories, or did you just not get the chance to contact Dan DiDio and get it published? <laughs> well, this was way before Dan's time. This was like the nineties, you know. So uh, right, yeah, of course. No, right. basically, yeah. it was a whole thing I sketched out mostly for myself because I have no idea what to do with it. I see. These days, I might have actually done something with it, but you know, it's uh, it's fun. Hmm. Interesting. Um, no, it's a fun story. Very, very disposable. Very lightweight. I think a lot of ways. But a good showcase for for Captain Boomerang, who is is always mm. one of my kind of favourite Flash rogues. Um, I kind of first encountered him in the pages of Suicide Squad, obviously, of course, in the week of um, in the week of the Crisis, where the Legend series was starting. But yeah, he's he's I think he's one of the most entertaining and one of the most visual of the rogues. Yep. and this is quite an interesting one. I suppose it even uh, is it even a twist on legacy, given that his dad's in it. <laughs> you know, let, let's sure. not stretch it. But it was, <laughs> but it's a very imaginatively told story. Yes. I mean, the as we say, the the narration being done unbeknownst to us by one of the the characters and mm-hmm. all the, ca- the the Carmine finger pointing captioning and yep. I think there was a lot of unnecessary captioning at, at points to mm-hmm. be honest maybe a few points here and there where some of the captioning could have just gone into the Flash's inner monologue or whatever but it, it worked very well Flash didn't really seem to have that much he was quite passive in a lot of it yeah but it was a showcase for Boomer and I think that's I think that's fine ultimately well the first half of the story is told entirely from the uh, perspective of Captain Boomerang being the main character so, so yeah, yeah it is interesting that way yeah, it's the equivalent, I suppose, of a Doctor Light episode. But you mean Doctor Who Light episode, as opposed to an episode about the character Doctor Light? <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, but you know, you know what I meant. I know. Well, just for the listener, yeah, clarification. Eh? Right, I'm sure the listener knows what we meant as well. <laughs> One thing I want to point out before we go any further is that halfway through the Green Lantern story, there's a nice DC Comics house ad which features issue 433 of Adventure Comics, which we'd already we've already covered by this point. Aha, mm-hmm. aha, uh-huh, uh-huh, interesting. I don't really have much else to say on this, really. I liked the captioning. I liked the Flash's ingenuity and in figuring out what would happen. And I liked the, the father-son dynamic. Have you got anything else you want to talk about? I wish the book had been rescued. That'd been a fantastic exhibit in the Flash Museum. Yes. Can you imagine? Yeah, I can. I'm imagining it right now. Or maybe the, the father of one of the other rogues might have picked it up and kept it going. Gasp. Can say. There's a thought. Yeah, I know. I don't think we'd really see much of the families of other rogues. That's what I was going to say as well. I mean, obviously, if that was the only time Boomer's dad popped up, did mm. anyone else's... Do we do and someone out there should be doing a, a Flash Rogues Gallery podcast? Oh, I'd love to. Anyway, um, yeah, anyway, after we do Challenge of the Known and Dial H for Hero and everything else we've talked about, uh, absolutely every, by every sketch. Anyway, apart from <clears throat> um, apart from Captain Cold's sister Lisa, I don't think we really see much of the other Rogues families. To be honest, like think of a fan. Oh yeah, we get Pied Piper's family, and much much later, much much later, there's there's something with the trickster's daughter mm-hmm. somewhere, isn't there? I've got that in my head. I can't remember where that's from. Right. Okay. That's. Post crisis, and to be honest, I'm kind of a bit behind on the, the rogue development. <laughs> yes, post crisis, aren't we all? <laughs> Pre crisis, I've got that down pat. So that's fine. Yeah, there's been so much. Even <laughs> going, which what was it? Um, was there not a, a final crisis miniseries called Rogues Revenge or something? Yes, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Listeners, go and start your own Rogues Gallery podcast and Pete and I will <laughs> listen to it and trail you and plug you on our show as much as we possibly Indeed. can. Indeed. David can guest star as uh, Captain Boomerang for you. Yes, please. Mm-hmm. Yes, please. Ross, that's, that's something else for you to do. <laughs> Maybe you could do that when you finish Starman. <laughs> <laughs> right, should we do the letters then? Yes. So these letters are from issue 230. Flash Grams, first one reads, Dear Editor, Carrie Bates, Flash, This Is Your Death in 227 was a piece of clever fun. Apparently you have decided upon a course of cartoon-like humour in Flash, and as long as you don't overdo it and present some serious stories as well, I won't complain. This current tale was full of delightful ideas. The scrapbook, having Boomerang's father record the adventure, the pseudo-naive explanation of Barry's disappearance in page 5, and the captain's notion that he's the first costume character with a costume that expands in contact with air. Ha. The nightmare dimension could have been more imaginatively portrayed, but I have no real pans for the Novik McLaughlin art team. Their work fit the cartoon atmosphere nicely. Then the correspondent goes on to talk about the Green Lantern story. That letter is from David Dash, spelt D-A-S-C-H, from Brooklyn, New York. Editorial response is... You don't expect us to dash off without explaining, do you? Our next correspondent tries to bail us out of the helicopter mistake. Yes, there was a whole thing. Peter would have loved that if we'd done the story. Apparently, <laughs> Green Lantern used his powering against a yellow helicopter. Yes. Peter would have thrown his copy of the comic down in disgust <laughs> the moment we got to that point. Mm. Yeah, the whole next letter is all about that helicopter conundrum, so we don't have to read it. But it's from Fred Schneider from New York, New York. And I'm wondering if that's the same Fred Schneider who is the singer on the B 52s. Could be. I know he's a bit of a geek. 
Uh, but I don't know if he was into comics. Interesting. Is Fred Schneider active on the socials? Could you ask him? I wonder. Is he still alive? I don't know. Oh, yeah, he's still alive. Yeah, no, I, still I don't know yeah. him. Oh, God. You, God, that's, that's, that's a bit grim. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Williams is dead. That's who he, he always reminded me of. Oh, yeah, of course. To get screaming back to the point, the mm. next letter reads, Gentlemen, Flash, this is your death in 227 was awful. <laughs> there were so many ridiculous gimmicks in the story, such as Captain Boomerang summoning his escape boomerang with telepathy. And it seemed as if the writer was using them so he wouldn't have to come up with a truly clever plot. I realise that you're trying to recreate Flash's early days by featuring old villains, but this is going too far. The story was so bad, it couldn't <laughs> even be classified as camp. Gosh. There's another thing which has bothered me for as long as I've been reading The Flash. The very concept, super speed equaling and even surpassing the speed of light, makes it physically impossible for Flash's foes to do what they have been all these years. Theoretically, Flash should be able to nab the supervillain, put him in jail and read War and Peace before the baddie even has time to blink. On page six, Boomerang is time for a whole speech <laughs> as the Flash bears down on him. Heck, if the Scarlet Speedster was really travelling at super speed, CB wouldn't even be able to see him. And that scathing report is from Brian Shuck from Bowling Green, Ohio. I have a feeling that we had a letter from Brian in one of the Spectre stories. We did, yes, recently. I'm pretty I sure. I can't remember. Yeah, it rings a bell. Editorial response to that letter reads, Shucks, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> what fun would it be if Flash put away the baddies that fast? We'd have to run 11 and a half pages of baddies reading War and Peace. Now, let's wrap up this issue's Flashgrams with a reader who really covers his subject. And the final letter reads... Dear Editor, The Flash is one of the coolest, most logical thinking and even tempered characters in comics, as his logical escape from the boomerang trajectory in this very issue proves. Why then is he portrayed as a terrifying, sweating, ugly <laughs> madman on this issue's cover? Don't you think he deserves better? And that's from Charlie Monroe, Tucson, Arizona. Yes, we didn't talk about the cover. It was another Defenders 39 moment, really, wasn't it? Yeah, but Barry didn't really see the book that much. He was aware of it. So yeah, but no. He certainly didn't read it and have that reaction. <laughs> I feel conned without realising it. The editorial response to that one is... If your idea of better is a smiling Flash calmly reading the book and saying, gee, so that's how I'll end up, it strikes us as rather illogical, and something a logical Flash wouldn't do. So says Bob Rosakis. Bob Rosakis is now on staff at DC. That is important. That's yes. as significant as the Terralecto leader arriving in London in time for the visitation of Doctor Who. Right, <laughs> if that makes sense to anyone. No, that's a fair point about the cover. Listeners, I've got a homage cover to this issue of The Flash that I'm going to stick up in the socials at some mm -hmm. point this week. And I also have a couple of homage covers for the story we'll be doing next week. It's homage cover fortnight on the Earth 2 podcast. It certainly is. Peter, if listeners wanted to check out our socials, how would they go about it? You can email us with your thoughts in this story, or indeed just for a chat, at the Podcast at gmail.com. In fact, I've had a lovely email. Oh, really? Just the other day from Andy Flounders, who says, I've recently discovered your podcast. It's fun, entertaining and well-produced. Your enthusiasm and love of comics shine through. And that's why I love comics. Comics should be fun, and this podcast oozes with it. Thanks, Andy. Andy goes on to say, I rode an indoor marathon, which is 42,195 metres. I put on the Seven Soldiers Omnibus podcast while rowing, and it entertained me for close to two-thirds of the event. Wow! <laughs> Crikey drinks. <laughs> Amazing! We are impressed. In fact, my pace got stronger, and it made me happy to hear all three parts together. I finished the event with a sense of accomplishment, and I heard a great story. Kudos to all who made it. Wow. Your passion and enjoyment shines through every podcast, and that's what makes you all stand out from the rest. Respectfully, Andy Flounders. Andy, thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, for creating that's the touch. That's lovely. We often say that we feel that we're shouting to avoid, so that's really nice for someone to just <laughs> sort of give us that such a positive feedback. And also, again, retroactively and retrospectively, thanks to, again to everyone that was involved in the Seven Soldiers story. It was an epic. Some of those fine members of the, the podcasting community have recently been recording some more lines for another upcoming episode. Actually, for a couple <laughs> of upcoming episodes. Or in fact, one of them might have gone out by now. Yes. So yes, so stay tuned for more of that. But yes, where else are we on the socials? Well, on Facebook and Instagram, we're at The Earth 2 Podcast and on Twitter we're at podcast underscore Earth 2. And again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the listeners who have got in touch uh, asking about my health. Yes, <laughs> I did have laryngitis. Uh, I am back. We are recording. My voice isn't fully back. 
it was lovely to hear from all the concerned listeners and uh, yeah i've had uh, warm thoughts from everyone it's, it was gen- genuinely heartwarming <laughs> shame it's not throat healing but it's heartwarming <laughs> so thanks everyone maybe as your heart gets warmer it'll make your larynx and stuff work better or something i don't know who knows i didn't do biology beyond the higher <laughs> listeners isn't it great to have peter back I'm I'm delighted, and again, thanks to Steve for, and Logan for stepping in. But yes, we're powering on, we're powering on. Next week, it's a story which I've had about six or seven foreign covers for it on my phone for years now. Can't wait. What are we going to do? <laughs> You'll have to wait and see. On that bombshell, I've been Peter. I've been David. Thank you for listening, folks. We'll see you next time on The Earth 2 Podcast. Podcast. Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime. And Captain Boomerang was up to something, that's for sure. His arms were restrained, but no one could put shackles on his wily brain. <laughs> I, read that. I read that as Willy Brain. <laughs> right, and Willy Brain supported menswear. <laughs> my grandpa's name was Willy Bain. It's, 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 oh, really? It's very oh, close okay. to it. It's funny. Anyway, right. <laughs>